absolutely hopeless when it comes to computer technology. So I hope I've pressed all the right buttons and you can see and hear. No doubt if you can't, you'll, you'll wave at Steve. Um, the first thing is to say uh, a huge thank you to Steve for uh, inviting me this morning to come and uh, talk in this illustrious series. Um, it's a great honour to do so. And uh, so thank you, Steve, very much for asking me. Um, it might be worth me just saying to begin with um, really how I came about having a great interest in Dom Gregory Murray as a figure. Uh, it's not just simply because uh, he was an organist and I am an organist. Um, it basically goes back to when I was a boy. I was a, a, a chorister and I remember vividly one Holy Thursday evening uh, singing for the Eucharist of the Lord's Supper. And as part of that uh, liturgy, the Ubi Caritas is sung. And uh, I opened my hymn book and sang this rather lovely paraphrase, really, in English of the Ubi Caritas with a very haunting tune. And I looked at the bottom of the page and saw that the composer was one Dom. Gregory Murray. And then a few uh, weeks later, I opened the book again and sang another hymn and saw the same name, Dom Gregory Murray. Now, at the time as a boy, I knew what Rev meant and I knew what Father meant when I read it, but I didn't actually have a clue what Dom meant. And then years later, I came across his music and I asked a friend of mine, who is this chap? Who is Don Gregory Murray? And he said to me, well, he's a, he's a monk. He's a Benedictine monk. And I thought this was fascinating, but on the one hand, you could have a monk and you could also have someone who wrote extremely fine hymn tunes. So his name has kind of stayed with me for a long time. And um, I first started to come to Downside about 11 years ago on a regular basis. And I suppose about four years ago, I asked uh, Steve and Simon in the library if I could look at the uh, papers of Richard Terry, Downside's first uh, director of music. I was very interested in this figure. It's an incredibly important figure, Richard Terry, in English Catholic music. And it wasn't long before reading through his material that the name of Don Gregory Murray came up again. So that led me off onto another path. And really since then, whenever I'm at Downside, I've, I've been in the archives finding more and more and more about this uh, figure who really uh, has captivated me in many ways. Now, unfortunately, I never met Don Gregory Murray and I'm absolutely certain there are some people who are here this morning who, who knew him. So my talk, uh, isn't going to concentrate too much on character because I, I don't say anything that obviously is untrue and I'd be very, very interested to hear people's comments uh, because um, I am going to write a book uh, on the subject and so obviously I want it to be as accurate as possible. So I'm very interested in hearing snippets about his, his life. Um, the talk this morning is going to concentrate on his uh, music and his monasticism, particularly in the early years. Um, and so, as I said, if you've got any uh, questions or comments, uh, please, please submit them because I would love to hear more. There, his life was multifaceted in many ways. I would never get through the entirety of it. Uh, there's a huge amount of material in the archive, but I hope it gives you some insight into this extraordinary character. If you were to find yourself on the busy Fulham Road in London, passing the usual assortment of shops and offices, restaurants, takeaways, etc., you'll eventually alight upon number 264, which happens to be an incongruous looking church tower sandwiched between two unprepossessing buildings. The archway underneath the tower leads you into the Servite Church of Our Lady of Dolores. Here in 1864, the first two friars of this ancient mendicant order 
of the servants of Mary arrived from Italy to establish their friary and parish. On the 30th of April, 1903, one of these Servite friars, Father Sebastian Mills, celebrated the nuptial mass of one John Arthur Joseph Mandeville Murray and Gertrude Santiero. John Murray was in fact the organist of the Servite Priory, who earned his living as a music publisher's assistant, while his new wife eventually uh, became a school teacher and then went on to become a headmistress of what we would call nowadays the School for Children with Special Needs. They set up home at 27 Hestercombe Avenue in Fulham. Their first child was born in January 1905, baptised Anthony Joseph. Their second son, Joseph Ambrose, was born a year later, and in 1907, the hat trick was achieved with the birth of Francis Arthur. The two central pillars of domestic life in the Murray household were the Catholic faith and music. Little wonder then that all three sons in different ways held fast to their faith and displayed a love of music until their dying day. Their first son, Anthony, responded enthusiastically to these strong domestic characteristics, both religious and musical. As a little boy, he heard an itinerant musician playing in the road outside his house. He was captivated by the experience and decided then and there to make music his profession. Looking back years later, Don Gregory was to comment that he was, quote, blessed with a Catholic upbringing, which included, as soon as he was old enough, daily attendance at the early morning mass. Of course, at that time, Holy Communion was only administered to those who had fasted from midnight. Years later, when discussing the relaxation of the strict fasting rules after the Second Vatican Council, he observed, I have a vivid recollection of a certain Saturday morning soon after I had learned to serve mass. I must have been about seven. When instead of going to an early mass, I undertook to serve at the 10 o'clock. Without advertising to the fact that I had already breakfasted, I received communion. When later in the day this came to light, I was marched off to see the priest, to tell him what I had done. Being a sensible man, he made light of it. And I never had any sense of guilt, even if I was urged to be more careful in future. For a devout, intellectually gifted, and musically talented boy, such as Anthony, it wasn't that surprising that his parents decided to send him to audition for the newly established choir at Westminster Cathedral. John Francis Bentley's great masterpiece had only been consecrated four years before Anthony joined the school. Anthony was to join the choir at that time that would establish itself as one of the world's great musical ensembles, particularly in the field of Gregorian chant and polyphony. The leadership and training of a choir in this rich repertoire required not just musical expertise, but vision, flair and tenacity, all of which were to be found in the first master of music, Richard Terry. Although Don Gregory later in life questioned some aspects of Terry's approach and the exact extent of his achievements, it cannot be denied that the solid roots that allowed his musical and religious vocation to flower were sown here, immersed as he was in the daily celebration of mass and the sacraments and the divine office all of which were accompanied by acres of Gregorian chant 
and sacred polyphony. Now, I think at this stage, it might be worthwhile me saying a little bit uh, about Richard Terry, not just because he had such a profound influence on the young Anthony Murray, but also because of his direct connection with Downside. Richard Terry, who was born in 1865, was a choral scholar at King's College, Cambridge. And he came under the dual influences of Charles Villiers Stanford and Arthur Mann, not just in, in repertoire, in the area of repertoire, but in the training of boys' voices. After working in schools in Bedfordshire and Highgate, he spent a short time as director of music at St John's Cathedral in Antigua. Following his conversion to Catholicism, he was employed as a piano teacher at Downside School in September 1896. But within a mere three months, he became choir master, organist and director of music. The next five years were to witness a flowering of chant and Italian polyphony at Downside. As a result of painstaking research, he produced new editions of masses and motets by English composers, such as Tallis and Shepherd, together with the masses of William Byrd. Little wonder that Downside Schola Cantorum quickly established itself a reputation for the quality of its singing and the importance of its repertoire, which in itself reflected a cultural confidence in the English Catholic Church. One commentator observing that this musical renaissance brought a dynamo of reform and activity which was electrifying after half a century of inertia. On the 28th of November, 1899, Richard Terry took his choir to sing for the opening of the new Priory Church at Ealing, where it enthused the preacher, Cardinal Vaughan, whose new cathedral at Westminster was in the process of construction. Just two years later, as it was nearing completion, Cardinal Vaughan appointed Terry as its first master of music. Terry brought his unbounded enthusiasm and ten tenacity to his post through his magnetic personality. He was a hard taskmaster, unremitting in his expectation of the highest standard of singing and effort from his choristers. He upheld rigorous discipline, but numerous choristers testified to him instilling in them a great lasting love for plain song and polyphony. As one well quoted, we were steeped in it through the immense quantities of it that we sang morning and afternoon, day after day, year after year. His regime was fearless. Boys were chosen firstly for the quality of their voices, but if after a year they were not highly proficient in sight singing, they were duly dismissed. At the same time, they were trained to have exact pitch. Now the school teachers, it seems to me, that make a lifelong impression on us for good or ill, tend to be the strictest, the kindest, the funniest or the quirkiest. Terry could undoubtedly instill fear in his choristers but they held him in the highest respect, even affection. Their nickname for him was Belly Bag. So into this bubbling cauldron of musical activity came the nine-year-old Anthony Murray. His musical talent already apparent. It doesn't take much to imagine what effect the alchemy of Richard Terry, cathedral organ, choir, chant, polyphony, grandeur of the building, the mystical beauty of the liturgy must have had on the young Murray, who was later to comment on the, quote, imposing and exact ceremonial 
giving the cathedral a dignified and solemn identity. He goes on. On some days, since my parents were both involved in the parish choir, and later when I was a choir boy at Westminster Cathedral, every day this involved two masses, an early one with communion, a later one with music. Putting it rather crudely, it might have been that at the early mass there was scope for personal prayer and devotion, whereas at the later mass one was con conscious of performing the liturgy. The timetable was exacting and unrelenting. Daily sung mass and the combined offices of Vespers, Compline and Benediction. In these early days of the school, life was highly disciplined, somewhat authoritarian, and run rather like a junior seminary in the hope that it would yield vocations to the priesthood. It is highly likely then that it was at this time that the first stirrings of a vocation were beginning to be perceived by Antony. For as well as Richard Terry, there were others at the cathedral who had direct links to Downside. The administrator, Monsignor Martin Howlett, who enjoyed a very long tenancy in the post from 1906 to 47, was an old Gregorian, and his brother, Dom Aidan Howlett, was a member of the community, becoming headmaster of Downside School in 1900. Anthony joined the choir at the onset of the Great War. Many of the gentlemen of the choir were enlisted to join up, but Terry was determined that the choir would continue with some of the boys taking the alto parts, their sight reading skills being tested to the limit. Eventually, Anthony rose to become head chorister and was exhibiting the first signs of the talent that would make him such an accomplished organist. Even as a schoolboy, he displayed the talent that would eventually make him such a fine organist, for he regularly stepped in to play the organ for services of the cathedral at short notice. Two of the great musical influences on Anthony, later Don Gregory's life, began here at Westminster. Firstly, his love of the music of J.S. Bach. Richard Terry initiated a series of concerts in the Cathedral Hall of the then very rarely heard cantatas of Bach. While in 1912, Terry produced the Westminster Hymnal, the second edition of which Don Gregory was to co-edit in 1939. And it was this book together with the newly in initiated Christmas concerts in the cathedral that sowed the seed for Don Gregory's lifelong love of hymnody and Christmas carols. Indeed, one could argue that his finest compositions are in fact carols, anthems, motets on Christmas themes together with his hymn tunes. As well as the diet of chant and polyphony, the young Antony would have been also would have experienced a stream of new masses and motets composed by such well-known composers as Stanford, Holst, Charles Wood, and the young Herbert Howells, who in fact wrote nine liturgical works for Terry's choir. For the devout Antony, inculcated with a devotion to the mother of God from his earliest years at the Servite Priory. His Marian choral composition composed at Downside can only have been inspired by the Marian music written for the cathedral by Arthur Bax and Herbert Howells. The latter's offerings described by Richard Terry as quite the finest written by a modern Englishman. Despite being a fellow of the Royal College of Organists, it counted little for Richard Terry, who actually didn't like the instrument very much. But Terry was a fine improviser who stressed the need for it in the art of plain song accompaniment. In 
Little wonder then that the young Antony who sat at his feet would also develop this talent and display it so impressively in later life at Downside. In many ways, Don Gregory displayed similar characteristics to Richard Terry, which reveals the influence one must have had over the other. They both hated the gray, loved the clear cut, the no nonsense approach to life and work. Anthony left Westminster Cathedral Choir and joined Ealing Priory School in 1920. Ealing had become a dependent priory of Downside in 1916. And just a year before Anthony joined, a new headmaster had arrived at the school, Dom Dominic Young, and he distinguished himself as a chaplain in the First World War and received the DSO and the OBE and mentioned in dispatches three times. It was in 1920, age 15, when Anthony Murray set pet pen to paper and composed a four part unaccompanied setting of the Easter sequence, Victor May Pascali Laudes. It was effectively his opus one. Anthony wrote at the top of the score, my first attempt at polyphonic writing. And also in the archive, there is in fact uh, the Ealing School hymn, uh, reigning in glory, Benedict our father with a very fine hymn tune. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think Dom Gregory actually wrote it, but I'm not 100% certain about that. In association with Richard Terry, his association with Richard Terry continued, and despite a growing vocation to the monastic life, he continued his organ studies apace. One month before he joined Downside, he gained the diploma of the associateship of the Royal College of Organists on the 21st of July, 1922. Now, no fewer than 19 boys from Ealing School were professed as monks of Downside between the wars. And for a boy like Anthony, who had spent his whole life up to then in London, who had been immersed in the beauty of the daily liturgy of Westminster Cathedral, together with the thrill and excitement of the choral and organ music, while also experiencing the horror of war, at Ealing, he had been given a first-hand glimpse of the character and rhythm of the monastic life and been drawn inexorably to it. So he decided to pursue a calling to a life that he was to be faithful to for the next 70 years. Turning his back on the prospect of an undoubtedly promising, illustrious career as a professional musician, he set off for the quietness of the Mendip Hills and the community of monks living the rule of St. Benedict that was to claim his allegiance for the rest of his life. Anthony joined the monastery as a postulant in August 1922, but within a month, huge change was looming as Abbot Cuthbert Butler who had been father to the community for 16 years, resigned. He was succeeded by Abbot Leander Ramsey, who rose meteor-like in the community, having become headmaster of the school barely five years after becoming a novice. 1923 was a momentous year for this new novice, not only in his monastic life, but in his musical one. He had passed the ARCO the year before, and now at the age of 18, he sat and passed the exacting practical and written exams to gain the fellowship exam of the RCO in January. A daunting trio of musical heavyweights comprised his examination panel. Herbert Brewer, organist of Gloucester Cathedral, Alan Gray, organist of Trinity College, Cambridge, and Sir Walter Parrott, organist of St George's Chapel, Windsor, and master of the King's music. 
He was duly clothed by Abbot Ramsey on the 30th of September 23, at the age of 18, taking the monastic name of Gregory. He made his simple profession before Abbot Ramsey on the 3rd of October in 1924. Having completed further monastic stu studies, Gregory was sent to Cambridge to read for a degree in history. Downside had established Bennett House in 1896, where monks could continue to live in a quasi-monastic life, rooted in the divine office and mass, while reading for a degree at the university. Unlike the private halls in Oxford, run by the Benedictines and Jesuits, St. Bennet's Hall and Campion Hall, that could matriculate their members, Cambridge had no such system, which necessitated the novices having to seek membership of a college, which normally meant Christ's College. For a musician of Don Gregory's technical and theoretical ability, it seems slightly perverse that he didn't actually read for the music tripos. However, he accepted the decision with humility. Father Andrew Moore, Don Gregory's executor and obituarist, made the following observation. It was perhaps a test of his humility and the single-mindedness of his vocation that his superiors made this choice. They were perhaps fearful that his evident talent would lead him out of the monastery and into the world of popular acclaim. During its history, Bennett House had a somewhat nomadic experience, occupying four different sites in Cambridge. Gregory went up in 1926 and for one year was resident at Park Terrace just across the road from Our Lady and the English Martyrs. A rigorous timetable of office, mass and academic study was pursued from early in the morning till late into the evening. However, Gregory, always a great lover of sport, still qualified to row in Christ's College second boat. Before returning to Cambridge, Gregory made his solemn profession before Abbot Ramsey on the 3rd of October, 1927. He became a subdeacon in 1930, deacon in 31, and ordained priest on the 3rd of April, 1932, singing his first mass the next day. The period between Don Gregory entering the monastery and the end of the 1930s saw a huge outpouring of his talent as both organist and composer. Choral works, organ works, transcriptions, arrangements, orchestral music flowed from his pen. He was hugely industrious and energetically productive, while the quality of his work was beginning to be recognised by music editors and publishers. When his brother Joseph was ordained priest in Westminster Cathedral by Cardinal Bourne, Gregory composed for him as an ordination gift, a six part polyphonic mass to be performed by the cathedral choir for the, his first mass the next day. Interestingly, the following week, the mass was performed at Ampleforth, but I can find no record of it ever being sung at Downside. Indeed, no copies of this Mass exist in the Library of Westminster Cathedral, and the Mass, oddly considering its quality, was never published. So I can only conclude that the last time the Mass was sung would probably be in around 1940. It's a beautifully crafted work and I hope we will be able to bring it to life once more before too long. The single most important thing though that propelled Don Gregory to national fame was the installation of the large John Compton organ in the Abbey Church in 1931. Clearly with the completion of the long nave in 1925 
the Abbey Church needed an organ worthy of the grandeur of the building. It took the vision and determination of the next abbot to initiate the project. In 1929, the community elected John Chapman as the fourth abbot of Downside. A scholar with a brilliant mind and recognized for his deep spirituality, he was also a fine pianist. Abbot Chapman decided that not only did the Abbey Church warrant a fine organ, but it needed to be one that would allow Dom Gregory full reign to display his great talent as a performer. The Abbey commissioned the John Compton Organ Company to construct what remains today one of their largest instruments. On Thursday, the 12th of February, 1931, Joseph Bonnet, organist of Saint Eustache in Paris, and president of the Gregorian Institute gave the opening recital to great acclaim. Some six years later, Don Gregory collaborated again with John Compton in the design of the new organ for St. Peter's Church in Gloucester, for which he gave the opening recital in 1937. Between 1931 and 1939, Don Gregory became one of the best known and highly respected organists in the country. This fame was occasioned largely by the BBC, who broadcasted some 52 live recitals from the Abbey over this period. Some people have joked that the Beeb seemed to have a permanent line rigged up in the Abbey, but I gather this really was the case. And looking through copies of the Radio Times from the 1930s reveals regular listings, sometimes on a weekly basis, of Don Gregory's recitals on both local and national BBC radio. Although he didn't keep much of his correspondence, he did keep most, if not all, of his recital programmes, which is quite telling, I think. They reveal a wide repertoire of organ works from Tudor composers through to the contemporary. Famous composers for the organ, such as Percy Whitlock, Basil Harwood and William Harris wrote to him, expressing their gratitude for performing one of their new works on the radio. New scores were sent to him by these composers, hoping he'd give them a performance on the radio. And meanwhile, his mother would send him new editions of organ music on a very regular basis. His library of organ music is largely in pristine condition. I mean, it looks almost new. And this is due to the fact that he hardly made any fingering or registration marks on his scores, except for the timings of each work. And not only was he a brilliant sight reader, he was also a thorough proofreader. And he actually delighted in discovering the odd misprint or error in a score and writing a note to the publisher. This delicate balancing act between monastic observance and being a well-known performing musician was not to last. It has been suggested that some of his brother monks at the time did not approve of this dimension of Don Gregory's life and were becoming irritated by the constant intrusion of the BBC and their yards of cabling. The broadcast mostly went out live just after the midday office, which led some members of the community to suggest that this really wasn't conducive to monastic observance. In the latter part of the 1930s, Don Gregory entered a crisis period. He put pen to paper and wrote an agitated, angry, rather bitter 
letter to one of his brethren, informing them that he just couldn't stand the place anymore. He had to get out. He was intent on leaving. The reasons are not given. But we can only conclude that the mutterings and complaints concerning his regular recitals and broadcasts had not only reached his ears, but had wounded him. Clearly the chasm between his monastic life and his musical life had not been bridged. One of his brethren also suggested that it was at this time he began to make more, state, more mistakes in his playing, especially in his peddling. Don Gregory was a perfectionist. So the realization that his technique was not delivering the highest of standards anymore is probably why he decided to stop playing for public recitals at this time and move away. Secondly, he was producing so many compositions and arrangements that this creative urge stood to overwhelm him. The way he came to see it was that he had to be either a musician or a monk. He could not be both. Father Andrew Moore again. The failure of his superiors to allow him fully to integrate music into his vocation as a monk at the early stage served only to make such a reconciliation so intense a struggle later on, and in some regards, to make it a failure. Just as war was due to break out, Don Gregory decided that it was his vocation that meant the most to him. And the place that music had always had in his life now had to be put to one side. In 1940, he was granted his wish and he left Downside, moving to the Priory at Ealing to serve in the large parish there, as well as being choir master. The combination of the war and the many needs of his parishioners had a huge effect on him. Never one to do anything by halves, he threw himself into his work. And his archive contains letters from many parishioners years after he had presided over their weddings, baptisms, funerals, who wrote to him at a significant anniversary, remembering his kindness. In 1948, he was appointed parish priest of St. Benedict's Hindley near Wigan, staying until 1952, when he was appointed parish priest of St. Benedict's in Stratton for the next 35 years. As a pastor, he was highly regarded for his diligence, his sympathy, his compassion and piety. Leaping through Dom Gregory's musical manuscripts, one score is dated the 23rd of September, 1949. So clearly his musical creativity had not been completely snuffed out. This particular composition was and remains highly significant. Once he had left the monastic choirs of Downside and Ealing, where the beauty of Gregorian chant wafted through the air, he discovered very quickly the abject poverty of liturgical music in his Hindley parish. He came to realize that his people had a very limited repertoire. Miser de Angelus, Orbis Factor, the Marian Antiphons, and probably the chance for benediction. The Gregorian propers were well beyond their abilities. Don Gregory could not conceive of a church where there was precious little music or singing of any worth. He came to the conclusion and held it for the rest of his life that unless Gregorian chant was in the hand of experts who could teach, direct, and sing it competently, then it was best to look 
but were the alternatives. He decided to put pen to paper and wrote his own congregational mass. Written, of course, for the Latin ordinary and later in English, he called it the New People's Mass. And all these years later, it has now sold over two million copies worldwide. And it is in this area of liturgical music, which is Don Gregory's second great claim to fame. He was unarguably one of the world's leading authorities on the subject of Gregorian chant. During the 30s, he wrote a number of highly dense, closely argued pamphlets on the subject. And in doing so, he made a significant contribution to the reassessment of early chant manuscripts and to the debate over its rhythmic interpretation. Always a black and white man, it was a mark of his honesty that years later he produced a major book on the subject, Gregorian Chant According to the Manuscripts, that more or less contradicted everything he had written about the subject in previous years. From the advent of the Second Vatican Council until only a year or so before his death, Don Gregory made a significant contribution to the music of the Catholic Church. The Council brought with it developments in congregational participation for which English Catholics were woefully unprepared. Don Gregory embraced the Council and its liturgical reforms with gusto. He was, and to some extent still is criticised, for seemingly turning his back on his years and years of study, dissemination and performance of plain chant. But it's important to remember, I think, that first and foremost, he was a son of the church. And if at that time it seemed that this was the mind of the church, a vernacular liturgy with its attendant new forms of musical expression, then so be it. It's also worth recalling that at the time, there was a great head of steam for liturgical reform among many of the parochial clergy. It was during the 70s and 80s that Don Gregory composed much simple congregational music for vernacular settings of the mass, together with many responsorial psalms. He was prominent in the use in England of the psalmody of the French Jesuit Joseph Genelot, whose music worked well with the English Grail Psalter. Shortly after they were introduced into this country, Don Gregory conducted a festival of psalms to a packed Royal Albert Hall. The Catholic Herald commenting, Don Gregory Murray, his monastic habit swirling about him, raised his baton to lead the greatest choir of psalmsters any monk anywhere in the world had the privilege to conduct. In addition, Don Gregory's own adaptation for English of the plain chant psalm tones remain in regular use, not least by his very own community today. He championed the vernacular in the mass so vigorously that when he embarked on a teaching tour to the USA in 1959, he was quickly dubbed Don Vernacular. Don Gregory was responding to an urgent need at the time for music for the liturgy. He was more than capable of writing to order and the archive is full of requests from Catholic, Anglican, Methodist clergy, organists, choir masters, head teachers, asking him to write them a mass setting or a hymn tune. Almost always after completing a work such as this, he would send the completed manuscript back with the attached note. If you don't like it, don't worry. There's always the waste bin 
much of this music is easy to pick up, it's serviceable and continues to be effective, which is what it was designed to be. He knew, I think, it wasn't great music. Indeed, he wrote uh, what I think is a truly atrocious folk mass, which to his amazement was performed at the London Diocesan Chrism Eucharist one year in St Paul's Cathedral. On the front of the envelope containing some of the copies of this score, he wrote, can you actually believe they sang this at St Paul's? And one area of his musical compositions where he excelled are his hymn tunes and texts. He wrote some 52 hymn tunes, half of which remain unpublished. Open any decent hymn book and you will find one or two hymns or arrangements of hymns by Don Gregory Murray. His reflections on the place of music in the liturgy would regularly appear in the journal Music and Liturgy of the Society of St Gregory, which he edited for several years, while in 1977 he wrote a small book on the subject, Music and the Mass. When he was parish priest of Stratton on Foss, he decided to compose and arrange music for the recorder. Indeed, the archive contains a huge pile of books of recorder music containing pieces that he either composed or arranged. There are numerous letters from recorder societies around the world thanking him for his advocacy of the instrument, particularly as a relatively cheap way of introducing children to a musical instrument. Some have suggested he became mildly obsessed by the recorder, but we come back to what has been said time and time again, that if he turned his hand to anything, it was nothing less than 100%. When the liturgical reforms were being introduced at the Abbey, Don Gregory's influence was considerable for he'd done his homework. He'd read and knew the rubrics backwards. Um, what's, what I found very interesting to find in the archive were several memos which he wrote to the community. Um, one of which was on the Monday following Palm Sunday. And it was clearly a time when the school was up for Holy Week and Easter. And during the reading of the Passion, the school had, as it were, a walk on part. So when it came to the, the bit in the Gospels where the crowd shout, crucify him, crucify him, the entire school did it. Now, this irritated Don Gregory beyond measure, and he wrote a fairly blistering memo the next day to the community saying, never again should this happen. And then likewise, um, he'd attended a mass, and it may have been uh, obviously a mass in the Abbey, where one of the community began the mass by saying, the Lord be with you, putting the emphasis on the last word. Again, day later, another memo from Dom Anthony saying this was not the right way to proceed. It should be the Lord be with you, not the Lord be with you. And he wrote, uh, one side, not two sides of A4, explaining in great detail why this should be. Another string to his bow later on in life was biblical scholarship. He struck up a friendship through correspondence with the Anglican biblical scholar Harold Riley. He read widely and wrote tirelessly on scripture, often translating from the French works that he thought deserving of a wider readership. I have counted at least 36 very long articles and detailed essays that he wrote for various journals on various aspects of scripture. In his latter years, Don Gregory returned to the organ bench, not so much the large Compton, but the small instrument in the Abbey choir that he had, had installed. And it was here that he accompanied 
the divine office as one would expect, with care and musical dexterity. For the most part, he didn't use written music. He simply improvised, using, for example, the opening phrase of that evening's office hymn. According to one musical observer, he would weave effortlessly an astounding range of themes into these liturgical improvisations from Rachmaninoff, Brahms, Elgar, and many others, including slipping in very subtly, happy birthday to you if a member of the community was celebrating another year. What is remarkable for a man of his talent is that he didn't actually listen to music. So he had held some of these themes in his head for a lifetime, while his knowledge of others can only have been from his reading of a score half a century before. Despite the various, various crises between monasticism and music that Don Gregory encountered and the heartache it brought him, coupled with his reputation for bluntness and not suffering fools gladly, he retained a dry, impish sense of humour to the end. Um, it's interesting to note that a, a month or so ago, I read a blog and it, it mentioned Don Gregory Murray and actually stated that he was known at the time as being the rudest monk in the English Benedictine congregation. Uh, he was brilliant, though, at writing limericks, some of which are simply unrepeatable in polite company. And there is a lovely story from the mid 30s when the school rugger 15 had an unbroken run of match wins in one term. Their last match that term was against Sherborne. Don Gregory stated that if they won the match, he would play on the Abbey organ, the Dwarfs March from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs at the end of benediction on Sunday. Downside won, and the march was duly played. It was so brilliantly wrapped up in an improvisation that his brethren had no idea what was going on. But as one old boy of the school commented at the time, the school knew and they were in rapture. Don Gregory's final struggle was with his health. In the 80s, his eyesight began to cause him many difficulties and he underwent a number of small operations. Then heart problems started to occur, which led to a heart attack in October 1991. A week or so before he died, he wrote a letter to a friend showing that he'd lost nothing of his dry wit. Commenting on his four weeks in the monastic wing of the infirmary, he writes, I stood it for four weeks and it nearly killed me. Poignantly, he goes on to say, my active days are over. Mercifully, I have no pain, but I'm very tired and I'm practicing for the eternal rest. I may drag on, of course, for many years, but we only get one day at a time. I value your prayers, Gregory. In the morning of the 19th of January, 1992, Don Gregory died while mass was being celebrated for the school in the Abbey Church. For a monk, made famous through his great musical talent, one might have expected a larger than usual musical menu for his funeral mass. But in fact, it was really quite simple. The music consisted very appropriately of the plain song Requiem Mass, Don Gregory's own beautiful setting of Psalm 42, like the deer that yearns for running streams, his skillful arrangement for organ of the slow movement of the Elgo cello sonata, concerto, sorry, and his most famous hymn tune, Surexit, finish the strife, the battle done. <laughs> 
All those years later, the school concert band repaid him the compliment for his gift to them of the March of the Seven Dwarfs. For, and I only learnt this uh, last week, and some very kind observer who may be here this morning offered this, that as he was lowered into the grave, they played College Girl, I Love You. When Cardinal Basil Hume died, it was said that the only possession he had left was his monastic habit. He'd given everything else away and had asked for his bank account to be completely emptied. That in itself was a preaching, an eloquent testimony to his life and what he believed. And I discovered a yellowing piece of paper in Don Gregory's files that probably says more about Gregory Murray's fidelity to his monastic vocation and his determination to live that life to the very end than all the words he wrote, sermons he preached and music he composed and performed. So let me just read it to you, it's unsigned. Dom Gregory Murray, his room. His room was very austere. He had moved into his room on the first floor facing east on his return from Hindley in about 1952. And the room had certainly not been decorated since then and was probably last decorated sometime previous to that. There was no carpeting or rugs on the floor and the bare boards were heavily worn. The room was very dusty with piles of unmoved papers gathering cobwebs. The furniture was very sparse. He had an old iron frame bed, which he also used as a desk. He did have a small desk which was covered in papers, but he never used it. This desk is probably most valuable and might be early 19th century with a red leather top and lacquered edges. There was a small single wardrobe containing one old clerical suit and a few jumpers and some old plastic bags, but otherwise nothing else. There were two not very good chests of drawers. One contained a few clothes. There appeared to be no shirts, but perhaps they were in the infirmary where he died. There were several packets of unopened and unused gloves and scarves, which had obviously been given him as presents, together with an un unopened bottle of sherry that must have been many years old. The smaller of the chests contained some old photographs and much of his manuscript music. On the other wall was a huge bookcase of no particular merit, which contained an assortment of books on music and scripture. There was a huge pile of empty used envelopes, just in case, but thick with dust. Over the wash basin was a very fine and very dusty Spanish crucifix, really rather delightful. Together with the table, this was the only thing of any value or interest, apart from his own music and notes. He clearly had a great devotion to his mother and there was a sole photograph of her displayed. He also had a devotion to the Madonna and child and appears to have had collected Christmas cards and holy pictures of the same as these were dotted about all over the place and in books. Another of his special interests was Julian of Norwich, for he had not a few books and notes on this subject. So just to uh, finish really with a uh, personal recollection, I um, attended mass at Downside, I think about three years ago. <clears throat> and usually for me, it was in term time and I walked into the Abbey just before Mass uh, and realised it 
Sunday morning, the entire school was there. It was for the school mass. So I crept in and sat at the back. And the school scholar was singing really very beautifully. I remember they sang uh, Mozart's Ivo Verum at the end. And then um, after the dismissal, after the blessing and uh, dismissal, there was a speedy rustling of pages, uh, everybody finding the final hymn, uh, the rich, uh, chocolatey sonorities of the Compton organ began rolling around the abbey, uh, introducing to my enormous pleasure and surprise Don Gregory's hymn tune, Sir Exit. Um, as the school raised the roof, I couldn't help thinking that despite all his many doubts and fears about trying to marry his musical talent to his monastic vocation, the two are now finally and blissfully reconciled in eternity, where in John Donne's words, there will be no noise or silence, but one equal music, no fears or hopes, but one equal possession, no ends or beginnings, but one equal eternity. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel.